Welcome to this lecture podcast for week five on the unauthorized decision-making topic. This topic is actually important because in our everyday lives, the executive makes decisions which actually affect us. And such decisions may, for example, pertain to the rules concerning who can drive vehicles. It may pertain to requirements concerning the use of seat belts or whether or not you're permitted to drink or eat uh, while you're driving. It can also be about questions of who can drive. It may also pertain to decisions by the executive concerning access to uh, public parks and beaches. It can also involve, for example, a decision of the executive to uh, quarantine uh, certain areas in the event, for example, of a serious health outbreak. Uh, would that be permissible? Would that, you know, in, in the event that the executive arrives at such a decision, would it be necessary for it to be able to point at a specific positive law, such as a statute, that would provide a legal authority for the executive to make such a decision? Uh, you can also have questions about whether or not it would be permissible for the executive to actually um, stop uh, boats that might be carrying um, illegal, uh, you know, boat refugees or um, illegal immigrants who would wish to enter into Australia. Would that also mean that the executive also might have the power to actually blow up these boats or even destroy them? Um, there, there can also be questions as to whether or not the police may be permitted to shoot to kill um, certain uh, identified criminals and terrorists. Uh, it can also have a question of whether or not um, random frisking or pat-downs of individuals by the police uh, for security, security reasons would be authorized. And uh, it can also involve questions on, as to whether or not um, certain benefits may be uh, withheld from certain individuals. So the examples I gave are instances when the executive uh, makes a decision or the executive takes action that obviously affects uh, individuals. And then you begin to ask whether or not those kinds of decisions or actions taken by the executive are actually authorized or not. And so the topic uh, for today in this lecture podcast focuses on the idea of unauthorized decision-making. And so after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain whether legal authority is required for every executive decision or action to be made. And we will connect this to the idea of uh, legality later on. And uh, the second point you should then be able to uh, be able to do as a result of studying this topic, would be uh, for you to be able to discuss and explain when an executive decision or action is unauthorized. So the key question that we have to grapple with is when can we say that an executive decision or action is authorized or unauthorized? And as I mentioned earlier, one of the key uh, constitutional law principles that we need to remember is the principle of legality, which uh, states that the government in general, and it's not just the executive, but the government in general, uh, must, number one, act according to law. And secondly, that when the government, and particularly the executive, when it undertakes actions that interferes with the rights or interests or legitimate expectations of its citizens, then it is crucial that the executive in that case must be able to point at a specific positive law that authorizes uh, that particular act or decision. And this is mainly uh, coming from the case of Entick versus Carrington, a decision made by a UK court uh, in the 1700s, which we will uh, discuss in greater detail in a short while. So for this lecture podcast, we wish to uh, focus on the key question on when we can say that an executive decision is authorized or unauthorized. Because if the decision is unauthorized, then there is obviously recourse uh, both to uh, 
uh, both to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, but more importantly, there is recourse uh, to, the, uh, to the courts on the basis of a, a judicial review. Now, so as a sub-question, we begin with a, with, with a question of whether or not every executive decision, in order for it to be lawful, uh, has to be supported by a specific legal authority that authorizes that decision. So does every executive decision, in order for it to be lawful, have to be supported by a specific legal authority that authorizes that decision? So that's uh, the basic question that we have. Uh, the principle is the question is important because uh, the principle of legality, as I mentioned, uh, especially in the case of Antic versus Carrington, tells us that for government action to be lawful, it must be based on legal authority, and otherwise, because otherwise it would be unauthorized and unlawful. And we begin to ponder on the notion of legal authority. Does it mean that it has to be based on positive law, such as a statute? And in the case of uh, R uh, versus Somerset. County Council, ex party uh, viewings. Uh, Sir Bingham, MR, or Master of uh, the Rules, also said that an executive command or order that has no legal authority uh, is deemed unlawful and hence may be ignored at law. Now, before we go back to that uh, question of uh, whether every executive decision needs to have a legal authority or a source of authority for it to be lawful. Let's just review some of the basics of judicial review. And as we said, and as I said, in the event that a decision is, an executive decision or action is unauthorized, then you can have recourse to judicial review. And judicial review um, can be undertaken on the basis of statute, on the basis of constitutional writs, meaning the constitution, or it could be on the basis of uh, common law judicial review. So the source, for example, of the statutory basis for judicial review would be the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977, which provides the clear statutory grounds for judicial review to be available uh, in certain cases. And in, uh, in, in that case, uh, that involves instances when an executive, when an executive or administrative decision uh, has been undertaken on the basis of an enactment. Um, and then, apart from that, you do have the Judiciary Act of 1903, specifically Section 39B, uh, which is a similar provision to the provision under Section 75. Uh, paragraph 5 of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution, where it provides that the High Court, in all matters uh, involving uh, writs of mandamus, prohibition, or injunction, has uh, original jurisdiction. So under Section 39B of the Judiciary Act of 1903, uh, the Federal Court of Australia also has the jurisdiction, the original jurisdiction, to issue writs of mandamus, prohibition, or injunction. Uh, which is, as I said, a, um, a provision that is quite similar to uh, Section 75 of the Australian Constitution, Paragraph 5, when uh, that writ of mandamus or prohibition or injunction is sought against an officer of the Commonwealth. And Apart, obviously, from the statutory uh, ground, the statutory basis for judicial review, there is also the uh, common law judicial review, which uh, is based on an assertion by uh, the courts that it is within the uh, power of the courts to always control uh, the excesses of the executive. So, when the courts, uh, when when there is an executive action or decision that is contrary to law, then the courts have an inherent power and authority to control or limit such an executive action and to therefore uh, make a finding that such an executive decision or action is in nullity for being contrary to law. Now, so let's go back to that basic question. Does every executive uh, decision or action in order for it to be lawful, 
uh, does it need to be supported by a specific legal authority? And the answer is no. In fact, there are many executive decisions uh, that are done without the need of any special legal authority. And in fact, as we will see uh, on the basis of point two later on, the only time when a special legal authority will be needed is if uh, an executive action or decision interferes with the rights of people. So for example, uh, the Federal Court of Australia in McDonald versus Hammonds stated that there are many activities in the ordinary course of administering affairs of government that may be carried on independently of any statutory provision expressly or impliedly authorizing that uh, particular activity. So as examples, uh, the, the executive can conduct public relations without need of any statutory authority for that. It can undertake uh, inquiries, it can create community assistance programs, it can manage and uh, develop property, it can enter into contracts, uh, it can incorporate the company to discharge government business, it can conduct legal proceedings, it can restrict participation in an inquiry, implement an anti-discrimination program, publish a building industry blacklist, or request extradition. So uh, clearly, there are many things that the uh, executive is able to do without need for a uh, statutory authority for that. So when I say that there is no need for a specific statutory authority, uh, what it means is that there is no need for an enabling legislation uh, coming from the parliament, for example, authorizing the executive to act uh, in, a in, in a certain way. So these examples that are shown in this slide, for example, are uh, executive actions that are deemed to be part of the inherent powers of an executive if the executive is to be able to properly perform its functions uh, as part of the government. As part of the, as, as one of the three branches of government. So, if if the executive uh, is is meant to be able to perform its functions, which is to execute the laws and to make sure that public services are made available to the citizens, then it is important to recognize that the government, the executive government, has certain inherent powers uh, that it can uh, that that it can uh, exercise without need for any specific enabling authority coming from the parliament. And there, what this also means is that if we uh, go back to the Constitution, in particular Section 61 of the Australian Constitution, which is uh, in Chapter 2 of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution, um, the Constitution uh, provides that the uh, executive uh, power uh, of the Commonwealth is vested in the Queen and is exercisable by the Governor General as the Queen's representative and extends to the execution and maintenance of the Constitution and of the laws of the Commonwealth. So there is a constitutional basis for the executive to exercise executive power. So that's one. Now, however, Apart from the fact that there is, in fact, a constitutional basis for the exercise of the executive of its powers, uh, there, there is what is known as uh, prerogative power, so that what this means is that even if there were actually no written constitution, even if it were not possible for the executive to claim any authority to uh, act or exercise certain executive powers on the basis of a constitution because let's assume that it does not exist. So uh, countries, for example, such as New Zealand or the United Kingdom, they don't have any, any written constitution. So it's difficult for the executive, therefore, to claim that they have executive powers on the basis of a written constitution because those written constitutions do not exist. So how then can it be argued or can it be claimed by the executive in both in the UK and in New Zealand that they have certain executive powers which do not depend on a statutory grant by, by, the, uh, by the parliament? And the answer is there are certain prerogative powers or inherent powers that are recognized to be a part and parcel of the executive. Uh, if it were uh, to be considered uh, to be in a position to actually properly perform uh, its, its job of uh, ensuring that there is public services available to the people, and as well as uh, its um, inherent duty 
to ensure that the laws of the Commonwealth are executed and maintained. So, for example, uh, some ex other examples of uh, prerogative powers would be the power, for example, of the executive to enter into treaties, the power to uh, order the conscription of individuals in the event of uh, in the event of war, um, the power to control uh, the entry of uh, aliens into um, Australia or into a territory. Um, so these are uh, examples of prerogative powers that does not require uh, any legislative fiat for the executive to be able to understate, undertake or do. Now, so we know, so based on the first point that I have stated, I have made the point that um, there are many instances when the executive actually is able to make a decision or able to act even in the absence of a specific uh, legislative authority or in the absence of positive law, meaning law, for example, uh, based on a statute that the uh, parliament passes. So the question, though, arises on whether or not, uh, I mean, the, the question arises on when an executive decision must be supported by a specific legal authority in order for such a decision to be lawful. And what is helpful will be for us to go back to the cases of Entick versus Carrington and Regina versus Somerset County Council or ex parte Fewings. For example, in Entick versus Carrington, uh, the Lord Chief Justice uh, said that by the laws of England, every invasion of private property, be it ever so minute, is a trespass. No man can set his foot upon my ground without my license, but he is liable to an action though the damage be nothing, which is proved by every declaration in trespass where the defendant is called upon to answer for bruising the grass and even treading upon the soil. If he admits the fact, he is bound to show by way of justification that some positive law has empowered or excused him. The justification is submitted to the judges who are to look into the books. And if such a just justification can be maintained, by the text of the statute law or by the principles of common law. If no excuse can be found or produced, the silence of the books is an authority against the defendant and the plaintiff must have judgment. So the case of Entick versus Carrington uh, clearly is the basis for the proposition that uh, for the executive to interfere with the rights of individuals, such as uh, being able to invade upon private property, then in that instance, the executive must be able to show by way of justification that there is some positive law that has empowered or excused him uh, to do uh, such a particular act. In the case of Regina versus Somerset Count, uh, County Council ex parte viewings, um, Sir Bingham uh, said to the famous question asked by the owner of the vineyard, which and referring to the biblical passage, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Then the modern answer would be yes, subject to such regulatory and other constraints as the law imposes. But if the same question were posed by a local authority, the answer would be different. It would be no. It is not lawful for you to do anything save what the law expressly or impliedly authorizes. You enjoy no unfettered discretions. There are lim legal limits to every power you have. As laws, as judge laws put it, the rule for local authorities is that any action to be taken must be justified by positive law. So if you look at this specific uh, case and the statement, the statements here made by Sir uh, Bingham, it would appear that uh, this contradicts the first point that we had that I had made, where I had said that not every executive action or decision requires positive law. And here he's again saying that um, it is not lawful for an executive to do anything save what the law expressly or impliedly authorizes, as if he's making the point that uh, the executive can only uh, undertake such actions uh, which the law expressly or impliedly authorizes. 
Now, on the one hand, um, that statement actually uh, proves the earlier assertion that I, I made, which was that there is no need for positive law uh, to be there to authorize every executive action or decision. And the reason for that is that, as uh, Sir Bingham also said, there can be an implied authorization. So there is, in fact, an implied authorization based on a common law recognition or recognition by the courts, as well as on prerogative powers, that the executive can, in fact, uh, act in, in certain ways without the need for any positive law or without the need for any uh, statutory uh, authorization coming from the Commonwealth Parliament. So that's one. Now, and more importantly, when we examine the case of Regina versus Somerset County Council, what this case involved was uh, a decision by the Somerset County Council which prohibited the, uh, the hunting of deer in, in certain uh, public lands which, had, which were then owned by the, which then were owned by the Somerset County Council. But prior to uh, such a resolution passed by the Somerset County Council in 1993, individuals had in fact been given the power or had in fact been given the right to shoot deer in the public land that then became owned by the Somerset County Council. So when the Somerset County Council then passed a resolution uh, prohibiting the killing of deer um, in the land that was owned by the County Council, then though the deer hunters uh, went to court to question the legality of the uh, decision of the Somerset County, uh, County Council prohibiting them from hunting deer again. And more importantly, this was because the basis of the decision of the Somerset, Somerset County Council was not so much that they complied with the law, uh, because they had the power under, the, under the, uh, the law to actually ensure that the public lands were properly maintained or developed. So they did not make a decision to prohibit the hunting of deer on the basis of that specific law, but on the moral ground that it, was a, it involved cruelty to be shooting deer. And the, uh, the Court of Appeal, in this case, uh, ruled that for the Somerset County Council to prohibit the hunting of deer, which was already then recognized as a right uh, that was available to certain people who lived in, the, in that area, so for, for the Somerset County Council to then be able to interfere with those rights, that it was necessary for the Somerset County Council to be able to show uh, a law that permitted them to interfere with such rights. So in, this was the reason why um, Sir Bingham said that uh, it is not lawful for you to do anything save what the law expressly or impliedly authorizes. In the case of Entick versus Carrington uh, as well, the Lord Chief Justice Camden said that um, an executive who invades private property must be able to show by way of justification some positive law that has empowered or excused him. Again, uh, emphasizes the need for there to be a positive law uh, to which the executive uh, can point to as the basis, as the legal basis for him to act in a certain way when his actions or his decision involves in, an interference with the rights of individuals. So when the executive undertakes actions that interferes or violates the rights of individuals, then it is necessary under the principle of legality, as uh, formulated by Lord Chief Justice Compton in Antic versus Carrington, it is necessary, therefore, for the executive to show some positive law that is the basis for uh, that executive action or decision that interferes with or violates the rights of individuals. So that is uh, point two. So uh, going back to that uh, question, when must an executive decision be supported by a specific legal authority in order for the decision to be lawful? The answer is an executive decision will only require special legal authority if it interferes with the rights of people. Now, but as to the question of what is the source of authority, as I said, it, is, uh, it should be pointed out that the source of authority need not be constitutional or statutory. So although 
it is possible for the executive to cite Section 61 as the constitutional basis uh, for executive action to be undertaken, or it could be uh, some some statute that uh, the Commonwealth has, Commonwealth Parliament has passed, uh, which could be cited as the basis for um, an executive decision or action. Uh, what what is also uh, necessary to be emphasized is that it is recognized that there are certain common law uh, powers uh, that the courts are willing to recognize as being inherent in the executive. So as I mentioned, there are certain prerogative or inherent powers in the executive, which enables it to act in a certain way um, without, uh, without uh, the need for any constitutional or statutory basis for it. So for example, as I said, the power to uh, control the entry of aliens would not require a constitutional or statutory authority because there is a prerogative power uh, on the part of the executive to act in a certain way. Now, equally crucial uh, on this uh, subject is the idea that the decision must affect a right. So where an executive acts in a certain way, even if it affects the lives of people, but what is affected is not actually a right of an individual or of the citizens, then uh, there can be no question uh, as to whether or not the decision, the executive decision is unauthorized. So the only instance, therefore, so the instance when there must be specific uh, positive law that would authorize the, uh, the, the executive to act in a certain way, particularly when it seeks to, to uh, interfere or violate the rights of individuals is that there must be an understanding that what is involved is a right of an individual. So for example, um, if the, the executive, for example, refuses to grant certain benefits to people who may have been subjected to sexual abuse, or the executive may say that a person is only entitled to a certain amount of um, medical um, benefits, uh, for certain sicknesses or illness, illnesses, it will be difficult for the, although in a sense, uh, such an executive decision obviously affects the, the, the lives of individuals or of citizens, it will be difficult for the individual affected by such an executive decision or action to complain that the executive decision or action is unauthorized. Because in that case, uh, the decision would not have affected a right because there is no right to certain public health benefits uh, unless uh, that right has actually been granted by, by law, meaning or in particular by a statute or a law passed by the Commonwealth Parliament. So if there is no right that is involved, then uh, it is difficult to claim that a positive law is necessary uh, to... Uh, in order to justify the, uh, an executive action or decision that may affect the lives of individuals or of citizens. So it's usual for the executive to affect the lives or, uh, of individuals or of citizens, but for as long as such actions do not affect a right on the part of citizens or individuals, then there is no need for the executive to be able to uh, cite any co uh, specific constitutional or statutory authority for their executive action or decision. Now, the third point that uh, we need to examine is assuming that there is a lawful authority for the executive decision. Does it mean that the executive decision will necessarily be legal? Now, if you look at the case of A versus Hayden number two, uh, what this case involved was uh, uh, it, it involved certain uh, activities of uh, federal armed police who were staging mock anti-terrorism exercises in a hotel in Melbourne. And in doing so, they ended up the armed police officer, the federal armed police officers violated. Uh, certain laws of uh, the state of Victoria. And so therefore, the, uh, because 
the federal armed police uh, were actually disguised or their faces they couldn't be identified when they were staging the uh, mock anti-terrorism activities. The, uh, the state police of uh, Victoria then sought for, uh, th th then requested the, um, the federal police to name these individuals so that they could be properly charged. And um, so the, the federal armed police uh, filed a case with the high court uh, asking uh, for the uh, state police to be restrained from uh, proceeding with their criminal investigation. Uh, they were, the federal armed police were saying that they were in fact authorized by uh, a, a law that allowed them to uh, undertake um, mock exercises and on that basis, therefore, they had, uh, you know, they, 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 they were permitted to do anything they liked on the basis of that legislation. The point being that for as long as they were following, for as long as the federal pol armed police were following a specific authorization, then they were beyond uh, any, they couldn't, they couldn't uh, be held criminally liable for their actions. The High Court, however, ruled that even if there is a lawful authority that therefore legitimizes uh, certain executive actions, uh, it is still necessary to remember that the executive action still has constraints. So in other words, uh, even if there is a statutory authority that would have uh, granted to a certain extent immunity from, uh, from prosecution, that, that does not provide a carte blanche or a blanket authority for the executive, therefore, to just do anything that it wishes. Because uh, in our framework of laws and under the principle of legality, there are still clear constraints on the actions of the executive. You have constitutional constraints, statutory constraints, and common law constraints. And the Constitution, for example, uh, is a is a, a clear uh, legal limitation on the powers of the executive so, so that the executive can only act according to the Constitution. And which means, therefore, that any empowering legislation that may be passed by the Parliament, by the Commonwealth Parliament, uh, it must, such a legislation, therefore, must fall within one of the heads of powers under the Constitution. Two, there, uh, it should, there should be a, uh, a clear showing that any action on the part of the executive does not violate, for example, the separation of powers. So if the executive were to claim that its actions are legal on the basis of a statute or law passed by the Commonwealth Parliament, and therefore um, it is not within the power of the courts, for example, to review the executive action, that would then be deemed unconstitutional. That kind of viewpoint would be deemed unconstitutional because in our system of government, it is always within the power of the courts to uh, look into the constitutionality or legality of uh, actions of Commonwealth officers. So in particular, if you look at Section 75, uh, Paragraph 5, the High Court has uh, the power uh, has the original jurisdiction in all matters where a writ of prohibition, injunction, uh, or mandamus uh, is sought against an officer of the Commonwealth, which is, as I said, um, a provision that has been copied in Section 39B of uh, the Judiciary Act of 1903. So apart from clear constitutional constraints on the executive action, there are also statutory constraints in the sense that even if there might be um, a statutory authority coming from the Commonwealth Parliament for the executive to act in a certain way, there are still other statutes that may in fact be in conflict with uh, such an enabling legislation. And in that case, the executive action must also have regard to other stat statutes that may in a way uh, control or delimit uh, any powers that are granted by a, a specific enabling uh, statute. And uh, finally, there is also a, a common law uh, constraint in the sense that, as we saw in the case of Entick versus Carrington and Regina versus Somerset County Council, uh, it is understood that 
when the executive acts in a certain way, there must and such actions interfere with the rights uh, and interests or legitimate expectations of individuals or citizens, then the executive must be able to point at a positive law that authorizes such an action. And so therefore, in, under the principle of legality, the courts uh, have made it clear that while a, it presumes that every executive action is lawful, it will not, however, presume that the, that the parliament authorized uh, the executive to trample or violate the rights of individuals or citizens impliedly. So for there to be, for the executive to be granted an authority by the Commonwealth Parliament to interfere with the rights of individuals or citizens, the common law rule is that the law express, uh, which provides for such interference must expressly provide, uh, provide uh, in such a manner. It will, the courts are not prepared to imply that uh, a, an enabling law authorizes the executive to interfere uh, with the rights and, uh, and uh, liberties or interests or legitimate expectations of individuals and citizens. Now, there are actually three ways by which an executive decision that interferes with rights may be unauthorized. One, it will be unauthorized if it is not authorized by a law. That, that is, there is no statutory law that allows or authorizes such a decision to be made. So as we said, based on Antic versus Carrington and the case of R versus Somerset County Council, ex parte uh, viewings, the common law rule is that for an executive decision that interferes with rights to be valid and legal, then there must be a statutory law that allows such, uh, such an interference or violation of individual rights and freedoms. Secondly, an executive decision that would interfere with rights may also be unauthorized, even if there is a statutory basis for it, if the action is ultra virus or beyond power. So even if there is a statutory basis for the executive to act in a certain way, it is possible for the executive to act beyond power or to act ultra virus. And in other words, it would the, the executive in uh, exercising its powers under an enabling law uh, acts in a manner that is in excess or beyond that which is authorized by the enabling law. And in that case, therefore, the executive decision would also still be considered to be unauthorized. And finally, um, an executive decision that interferes with rights may be unauthorized if the purported legal authority for the decision making is unlawful because the legal authority, for example, violates the Constitution. Uh, number one, because it violates the notion of separation of powers, or two, um, the enabling law uh, violates, is, is not within the heads of power on which the Commonwealth Parliament can legislate on. So in that case, uh, the purported legal authority for the decision making would be unlawful, or it would be contrary to law in the sense that there is some other law that um, passed by the Commonwealth Parliament as well that would actually, that would have curtailed or limit the exercise of certain executive powers or because the uh, interference of rights uh, is not something that is expressly authorized by a statute passed by the Parliament. So in other words, uh, the courts will not sanction an implied authorization by a statute uh, for the executive to violate or interfere with the rights of individuals or citizens. So after studying this topic, you should then have been able to discuss and explain whether legal authority is required for every executive action or decision to be made, and when an executive action or decision is unauthorized.